in this class uh, we will talk about uh, something what is known as substrum analysis. Well, uh, by now you know that in the signals there could be side bands because of modulation. Okay. We have just seen that side bands uh, could be because of frequency modulations, side band because of amplitude modulation. In the case of amplitude modulation, I have the side bands, you know, F C plus minus F M. Okay. And in the case of uh, frequency modulation, I have you know, F C plus K times F M, where there will be multiples of the modulation frequencies. Now, imagine if there are not one source of modulation, but there are several source of modulations in a signal, particularly a multi-stage gearbox. So, there will be a family of side bands. So, in a signal if I have a lot of side bands apart from the fundamentals, you can imagine the problem I will have in the frequency spectrum as to relate to which frequency or which side bands came from which machine, okay, that is the problem I have in front of me. Okay. So, this substrum is a technique by which we can cluster a group of side bands coming from one source as a single parameter. Particularly, substrum for its you know, utility, actually what happened in a substrum is such a powerful signal uh, technique, analysis technique in which it can distinguish between side bands very easily. A lot of this earthquake signals or seismic signals, they have a lot of side bands human voice or speech signals, they have lot of side bands okay, to understand between uh, different pronunciation, different uh, words which are coming out of a human being, particularly for speech processing, substrum is very, very useful. So, substrum started its origin is uh, from earthquake signals and from uh, human voice signals. And then when later on uh, we as a machinery diagnostic engineers found out that our gearbox signals also have a lot of side bands. So, why not we use substrum to understand more about this gearbox signals for the fact that they can distinguish and identify different groups of side bands coming from a gearbox. So, what is this substrum? If you look into this equation here, it says that substrum of a signal is the inverse Fourier transform, you know, F minus to the power minus 1 is the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of a signal and its logarithm of that Fourier transform. Okay. So, because you are doing an inverse transform here, the system is again back to the time domain. Okay. So, let me graphically represent this to you. Suppose I have a signal x t, I do its Fourier transform, I will get a signal x as a function of f, which can be written as x real as a function of f plus x imaginary as a function of f. Okay. Now, if this frequency signal has for the sake of argument has lot of side bands. And these are the side bands around a particular frequency and then on top of it there will be noise this becomes very difficult to understand as you will see in an example I will show you. Okay. So, now if I do a inverse Fourier transform of this, I will get back x substrum in another time domain and this is what is known as the substrum. Well, how this is done? 
because to do the inverse Fourier transform because I am having a real sigma a real quantity here and I am having an imaginary quantity here. So, to do the inverse Fourier transform you take the logarithm of the amplitude of this as the real part and the imaginary part will be the phase. But this phase will always be from minus pi to pi. So, this will be a discontinuous function. So, to smoothen it this has to be made a continuous function and this continuous function for the phase is done by a technique which is known as phase unwrapping and there are many algorithms available for doing this phase, uh, phase unwrapping. So, once I have this real and imaginary of the frequency converted one the real part being the logarithm of the amplitude and the imaginary part being the continuous phase. Once I have such an edited spectrum then I do what is known as the inverse Fourier transform to go back to the frequency uh, to, to the time domain. Now, in the time domain what happens because in if you look at substrum the way it comes it is just the spectrum C replaced by S. Okay. When we had a frequency as the x axis in the spectrum here it will be it is known as the q frequency. Okay. So, I will get different q frequency here Now, this q frequency I will get a certain peaks here. Okay. Now, this is in time domain. So, say suppose this is T 1 time okay, and then say this is T 2 time. F 1 will corresponds to 1 by T 1, F 2 will corresponds to 1 by T 2. So, if there is a high amplitude at a particular q frequency of T 1 that means, in this spectrum I had high amount of side bands at frequency f 1 because otherwise it would be very difficult if I go back here it would be very difficult I will show you an example it will be very very difficult to find out which frequencies are predominant or which side bands are predominant from such an FFT analysis. Because FFT analysis you know for our class we have seen in a nice pure tone and nice mathematical functions we get neat Fourier transforms, but in reality once you go to the machines we will have so many unknown frequencies it becomes very difficult for us to uh, find out which frequencies are present which are uh, the defect frequencies and so on. So, if I do this substrum I can do find out whether f 1 is strong enough or f 2 is strong enough or f 3 is strong enough or so on okay, depending on as many q frequencies you have. Now, question is you would have seen f f t can be done by the n log n 
algorithm and it can be implemented in real time. Okay. Unlike FFT, substrum cannot be done in real time because a block of data has to be taken, they have to be processed to find out their log amplitudes, they have to be processed to find the unwrapped phase as a continuous signal. So, once we have an FFT, then once you go for a system analysis, there are software who will do this calculation for you, but then it is not real time, it will take some time for computation. Once such computation is done and then once you do the substrum, you will see the harmonic, uh, the amplitudes or the raw harmonics as they are called at different Q frequencies. Okay, and then you can find out whether a particular group of sidebands is present or not. Another effect of substrum is it deconvolutes or removes the effects of the path because if the two signals are convoluted you know you will or the effects are there suppose a signal x multiplies with signal y okay but if i take the logarithm because i am taking the logarithm it will be log x plus log y so the effect of the path is actually added to a signal which can be nicely removed once you do substrum so that is why substrum had an important application in seismic analysis of signal. Because if an earthquake occurs, the signal which is recorded by us is signal x times signal y. Y could be because of the path from the epicenter of the earthquake to the location where your transducers were put. So, this effects could be added and removed and their effects can be eliminated, eliminated once you do substrum analysis because of this logarithm property of the uh, property of logarithm. Okay. So, that is another advantage of substrum analysis, but you know here we will see same also happens. Suppose, I have a large gear box, lot of signal contamination occurs because of the path, whether it is coming from location bearing um, through bearing A or through um, bearing A, B, C, all those effects will be lost or easily removed once we do substrum. So, to summarize, substrum is a powerful method to find out sidebands in modulated signals. Now, uh, we will go to one example, wherein we will see how substrum analysis helps us diagnose the fault on a cement plant. If I was to show you here, actually what happens in a cement plant, this is a large rotary kiln. Okay. This is about, you know, if I was to explain you the cement plant here, this is a kiln wherein all the mixtures for making the cement you know, or the mortar mix, the limestone, the etcetera, they are put in this drum and in this drum, there are very, very hard uh, stones or rolling kind of rocks, which will be, it is like a tumbler, it is like a tumbler and this drum, this diameter could be about you know 2 to 3 meters, okay, this diameter and this length could be about you know 7 to 8 meters and this, this there is a small inclination between this feeding end and the delivery end and this could be about 2 to 3 degrees slope. So, you put in the raw materials and this the beauty of this is or uh, the unique part of this is this drum rotates at about 2 to 3 rpm it rotates very very slowly and this media along with this uh, grinding media along with this feed is mixed and finally end of here you will have the dry cement powder coming out okay cement mixing uh, cement manufacturing is very very easy in that sense if you have the right proportions of the ingredients you just grind them and you will get cement powder. It could be a mixture of fly ash, limestone, uh, gypsum, etcetera, and then you just grind them. So, this is nothing but a grinding mechanism and same is, same also happens to your you know, 
uh, your washing machine detergent, etc., they are also manufactured in the same process. You will have some ingredients, they could be temperature controlled, and then you have a grinding media. But from a mechanical engineer's point of view, you see that this is running at 2 to 3 rpm. And I have this big motor here, this could be about you know, 900 horsepower. This motor is running at about you know, 1200 rpm or you know, 1400 rpm or 2800 rpm that depends on the number of poles in the motor. So, obviously, from 1400 rpm if I was to go down to 2 to 3 rpm, you can imagine the amount of speed reduction required in this gearbox. So, a very critical thing in such a cement plant is this gearbox. So, this gearbox is a heavy gearbox with a lot, such a large speed reduction. Obviously, I cannot get such large speed reduction in just one gear. So, there are intermediate set of gears okay, and they are helical gear, they can take lot of load and so on. And then we have this gearbox which is uh, uh, having the speed reduced and then we have uh, sometimes this speed is also not uh, to 2 rpm. We have another which is known as the bull gear here all around the drum there is a ring gear and then there is a pinion gear and then finally, this brings about the speed reduction. And then so that the uh, there is a torsion shaft here and this is the weakest member here. So, if there is any uh, failure the torsion shaft will uh, shear and fail. Okay. This is just a safety measure in the sense you know we do not want any, the, any of the bearings to fail or the gears to fail, but just let this torsion shaft shear. Okay and then they take, they can take in lot of uh, sometimes this is uh, held uh, by plumber blocks here and um, the problem here is this bearings in this gearbox suppose i put a transducer here they will be capturing phenomena of all the gears capturing phenomena of some of the gears here and bearings so, now question is which bearing has a fault and that is what if you do the analysis you will see that uh, the, the same problem occurs at which side band corresponds to where and how do I find that. So, this is just sorry this is just to give you a small example of the dimension of, of this plant. This drum has an uh, OD of 2500 millimeter ID of 2350 millimeter and it is 12 meter long and it weighs about 70 tons. You can imagine the magnitude of the cement plant mill or the drum. The girth gear has a 150 teeth, the girth pinion has 21 teeth, the girth gear or the ring gear okay. and then there is a speed reduction from 21 teeth to 150 teeth. The torsion shaft has an idea of 395. Uh, sorry uh, OD of 395 OD, there are couple of gear couplings and in this uh, gear boxes there is a uh, pinion, gear and all these different modules are there and the number of teeth are also mentioned here if you can read that 17 teeth in the gear stage 1 pinion, 61 teeth in the uh, stage 1 gear, 62 sorry 22 in the stage 2 pinion, 34 teeth in the stage 2 gear and then you can work it out. The motor is a three phase in, uh, induction motor with a 600 kilowatt and it runs at 985 rpm and bearings for location 3, 6 are given and then uh, the <coughs> just for your uh, benefit, the grinding and mixture material in drum is about 39 tons is the mixture material. Uh, so, we get about uh, 4000 uh, kg of cement in it because this 39 tons is the weight of the grinding media and then the cement raw material flow is about 12 tons per hour and the drum filling ratio is about 25 to 40 percent. The drum is of course, not entirely fill, it is like a hollow drum which is churning with this uh, grinding media and the raw material. So, we, get, we are getting about 12 tons an hour of cement from this plant okay. and this is what it is there in a cement plant. So, as you will realize be it a cement plant, be it a um, uh, detergent plant, this 
gearbox is very very critical to the plant if this gearbox fails or if this motor fails the plant is shut down okay and uh, this is uh, some of the views of this uh, this the torsion shaft and this plant is very close to us you know we had done some measurements there after a failure and then we had to do a diagnosis also this is the uh, pinion and this is the drum which is rotating okay this is the other side and the ring gear or the girth gear is inside this enclosure okay and the pinion is here and this is the torsion shaft and and this is the gearbox okay this is the motor here so motor is driving the input stage intermediate stage and then this side goes to the torsion shaft and because of the i would say defects because of obvious reason there are certain defects so we put accelerometer at the bearing locations accelerometer near the foundations and we had taken the measurements of this uh, vibrations simultaneously and <coughs> obviously this uh, measurements cannot i mean this analysis as i was telling you substrum cannot be done real time on the fly so we have to record the signals in a dat recorder wherein you can record almost eight channels of vibration simultaneously to a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz you can record them in the step and then you know because in such a uh, dusty environment we cannot be because cement dust you know if you go to that plant a lot of cement dust everywhere we cannot be putting computers and sophisticated equipments and then doing an analysis setting to a uh, area of you know a uh, cement dust so all you do is you just record them in that media bring them to the lab and then use your softwares of uh, matlab you can be doing fft and then do this uh, <coughs> substrum analysis as per the <coughs> algorithm i just mentioned and then of course you know another uh, uh, study which we did just to see the dynamics of the bearings this is another view of the cement mill is you know this is the stage 1 pinion the rotor shaft <coughs> the compound gear train torsion shaft girth gear and this is the drum so you can <coughs> imagine <coughs> the dimensions of the problem okay now these are the vibrations of the cement plant at different different locations <coughs> and uh, all we have shown you here is this spectrum these are just the fft spectrum and these are real fft spectrum obtained from the eight different locations on the cement plant while the operations were going on and if you look at any one spectrum it becomes very very difficult for anybody to find out which kind of side bands are there and if i so this is very very difficult for us from uh, a signal analysis point of view to find out the group of side bands uh, so this is just to tell you the severity of the problem we have in hand so now this is the vibration spectrum the top one is the vibration spectrum this is in kilohertz near the bearing of the multi stage gear box and then you will see a group of side bands occurring okay and then i would not know so if i if i come to the second plot here they are all in time domain and if you look here the corresponding frequency will be shown and you will know well this corresponds to a particular um, rotational shaft of the gear and then we will know its uh, frequency content and from this key frequency we will know well this means this has an high amplitude means this is the strongest side band and that is what substrum helps us in i will give you another example here uh, just from this gearbox so you suppose i have a pinion okay so this is having uh, 20 teeth and so this is having uh, 50 teeth suppose this is running at uh, 1200 rpm 
and this corresponds to 1200 by 60 that is 20 hertz. So, this will be running at a speed of 20 into 20 by 50 that is equal to 400 by 50 that is equal to 8 hertz right. So, so the gear meshing frequency is nothing but n times T 1 this is 20 times 20 times 8 times 50 that is 400 hertz. Now, suppose you know for the sake of measurements I put this set in a gear box this is the gear box casing and I put one transducer. to do the measurements ok. It may so happen if I look into the time history of the signal which I have measured, I will get something here, but at most the analysis I do in time domain is I can find out their RMS, mean, kurtosis, etcetera, but this will only give me a relative measure of the strength of the signal and that is all. I cannot pinpoint whether my fault has occurred in a pinion or a gear, but if I do a FFT analysis, what is going to happen is I may see on 8 hertz signal, uh, 20 hertz signal and few other signals, but what is going to happen is and this is very, very important this could be this could be 8 hertz, this could be corresponding to the rotational speed of the gear, this could be 20 hertz corresponding to the rotational speed of the pinion, this is the gear meshing frequency of 400 hertz, but what I will also see is the side bands around the gear meshing frequencies and I will draw another family here. Okay. This spacing in one case will be 8 hertz, in another case it will be 20 hertz. Why has this occurred? Because modulation is there, because of modulation side bands have occurred. So, I have got a group of side bands. Okay. Now, this is very nicely drawn here, but if you go back to my actual measurement and this is what it is looked like, it will be very difficult for me to find out. I may find out the gear meshing frequencies but here other than the gear meshing frequencies, there will be frequencies coming from the bearings, frequency coming from many other machineries. So, it is very difficult to for me to know whether the side band is because of a pinion or because of a gear. 
So, the power of the substrum is to identify which sideband is more strongly predominant. For example, in this gearbox, I will know if a sideband occurs at 8 hertz, that means I have signal coming from my gear. If my sideband occurs at <coughs> uh, the 20 hertz, I know this will be from my pinion. Okay. So, what is, what is going to happen? Now, if there is a defect, it may so happen that the amplitude of the sidebands around the gearbox is going to increase. The frequencies are not going to change, frequencies are fixed because of the phenomena. So, this amplitude of the sidebands will increase. And this is very nicely explained here, but in real world signal it will be very difficult for us to identify the sidebands. Forget about whether to know whether they have increased or decreased. But if I do a substrum, see the Q frequency and know well you know it is this frequency which corresponds to the pinion which is increasing, I can say for sure that the sidebands of the pinion has increased. So, pinion is at a fault and that is the power of substrum analysis. So, sometimes if you have done a good measurement, a good kind of frequency analysis, if you have a good delta f, you can uh, do a good resolution and then you may be able to distinguish them, but substrum otherwise is a very, very powerful technique to determine uh, modulations in <coughs> signals. Okay. <coughs> but this will be again complicated by the fact that while doing all these operations, suppose uh, speed of your machine changes, then what is going to happen? We will have frequency smearing. Okay because once it was 1 hertz, uh, say 10 hertz, next time it was 10.1 hertz, next time it is 9.1 hertz. So, instead of getting uh, and then if you do multiple averages, instead of getting a sharp peak, you will land up with a signal like this. So, now you will be confused, now what, what has gone wrong with my machine? Is it this frequency, is it this frequency, is it this frequency? So, this is very important while doing all this analysis we have to ensure that the speed is not changing or otherwise we do what is known as the synchronous averaging or which we do what is known as the order analysis. or order, order tracking. By order, I mean one rotation or one rotational speed, no matter what. So, it is the time taken to rotate by one uh, revolution and it is inverse. Okay. So, order analysis, if the speed is fluctuating, the signal will be taken for the complete revolution. So, we will not miss that and that is something we will discuss uh, in the later class. But in uh, substrum analysis, the advantage is it, it will detect the sidebands and also remove the effect of the uh, path. So, if I was to go back again to the uh, vibration spectrum of the girth gear support, this is how it is, the real world signal is uh, full of so many frequencies, because this is the frequency domain it becomes very difficult to identify well whether it is this frequency, this frequency and so on. Okay. But once you do the substrum, you will see the important uh, group of uh, frequencies getting clustered into this Q frequencies. Okay. So, uh, again in MATLAB, you know the software which we are using in our 
class. You could look into the commands like seps term, c seps. Okay. If you do not take the uh, logarithm of the amplitude, now you may also land up with you know different forms of the seps term, whether it is a complex seps term or a magnitude seps term. So, there are many ways by which people represent the data out of a seps term. Okay and sometimes they call it as a power spectrum. If you are dealing with a power signal and auto power spectrum, then you will have a power substrum. Okay. Some, because you know, if there is a voltage square term I, or an amplitude square term, I can call it as an auto power spectrum. If I do a substrum of an auto power spectrum, it will become what is known as a power seps term. Okay. There are different ways of representing this data, but uh, we can uh, generate signals in MATLAB. I can briefly tell you how to generate a signal in MATLAB. For example, uh, we can uh, first is you know in MATLAB we can write your own M file. Say for T is equal to If I take del T as say 0 0.001 hertz, that means F s is equal to 1000 hertz. I can generate a signal x is equal to 10.0 sin 2.0 star pi star uh, F say may be 10.0 star del T star T. So, this will generate a signal x. Okay. I could modulate this signal by x m as ten point zero sine of two point zero star pi star times sin of 2.0 star pi star so if you generate such a signal i have a carrier frequency of 50 hertz, a modulated frequency of 10 hertz, a sampling frequency of 1000 hertz. A modulated frequency and then sampling frequency. So, once you do the FFT of such a signal x m, how do you do that FFT of such a signal f m? Suppose you write x f is equal to 2.0 by suppose you have taken uh, 1000 data points. star absolute value of 
f f t of x m, you will get the amplitude in the frequency domain. And then in such a spectrum, you will see the frequency of f c plus f m, you will see f c minus f m, you will see f c f m. Okay. And if you do the substrum of this signal, you need not take the f f t. So, you have to look into the algorithm c subs of x f equal to x c substrum of x f. So, f x this is in the frequency domain and this is in the time domain. So, you will get all the signals which has uh, which corresponds to this will give you in the q frames view. So, you will get the q frames corresponding to the frequencies of f c minus f m and f c plus f m in the substrum and this you all can uh, do in uh, program like MATLAB. Okay. Now, if I was to come back to my example here, again look at the viruson spectrum and substrum at gearbox, gearbox base. If you are just to compare the gearbox base because of a very, very poor foundation, you see so many frequencies are coming up in the spectrum and if, if, and if I asked anyone to find out the frequencies contained in the signal, you will be all uh, scratching your heads, you know, getting lost, uh, what are the frequencies here. But the same spectrum converted to a substrum, you will see the group of side bands coming up, uh, q frequencies clustered, side bands clustered into their families and you will see whichever q frequency has the highest amplitude, you know that has a strong presence in that signal and that is how substrum helps us identify signals, helps us uh, finding out the important uh, frequencies in a spectrum. Okay. The effect of the path etcetera is lost because you know if you look here at the gearbox base lot of effects of the path etcetera was there, the gearbox base was loose. In fact, we had discovered many looseness in the gearbox uh, foundation itself and all those effects are nullified once you do the substrum. Those effects can be easily removed. And uh, similarly, when we did on the motor and gearbox only, we could see the spectrum of different natures altogether okay and uh, from this uh, example actually what happened we could uh, find out the characteristic frequencies of this signal which were not apparent in this spectrum but once we do this did the substrum we could find out the characteristics q frequency in the substrum and we could pretty well conclude that the bearing 2 was loose on the foundation, bearing 1 and mill, uh, the mill were misaligned and pinion on the gearbox was damaged. In fact, uh, later on we removed the gearbox and the subsequently it was reported that one of the pinions in the gearbox had a damaged uh, tooth. Okay. So, this uh, tells you how powerful substrum is to actually you know not let you scratch your head when you see a spectrum from a real world machinery signal. Okay. Uh, spectrum from a real world machinery signal has lot of frequencies which we may not be able to account for okay, because of 
All I know is the defect frequency, but there are so many extraneous signals which could be from nearby machines, which could be from machinery parameters which I am not even aware of. But if I know I am looking for a particular family of sidebands, I can very easily do substrum analysis and then see them at the Q frequencies. Because one thing you should recall, recollect Q frequency is 1 by or inversely, I will not say 1 by, but is related to this 1 by the frequency. So, Q frequency is in time domain usually in milliseconds and this is in hertz. So, there has to be an inverse relationship. So, we have a time to spectrum to substrum. So, this is in the frequency domain and this is in the time domain. Of course, this is to okay, this is the relationship and this is time and skew frequency. And this of course Okay. So, the effect of all the path properties are lost once we do substrum. So, substrum ap applications are also in speech, seismic and then of course, in machinery diagnostics. This is uh, not a real time operation, this is on a stationary signal. I may not be able to do substrum on a non stationary signal. For example, one transient that will be very, very difficult, okay. but if this transient is captured, we can do some sort of an analysis of it. Okay. But this has given way to nowadays you know what is known as simultaneous or joint time frequency analysis and there are few modern methods of signal processing like the wavelet analysis, short time Fourier transform, which has been nowadays you know used in machinery fault, fault diagnostics, particularly for <coughs> non stationary signals. But in this uh, very preliminary or pre um, the first course on machinery fault diagnostics and signal processing, I will not be focusing on these aspects of signal processing, but just to it will suffice that there are methods available today, wherein we can do analysis of non stationary signals by the wavelet analysis, short time Fourier transform, wherein the signals frequency is changing from sample to sample and then we I need to know in three dimensions you know as a function of time, as a function of frequency, amplitude. And these techniques are available when we can see for example, I will give you examples of non stationary signals something breaking, cracking, impulse door slamming etcetera. These are phenomena you know, something hitting, rubbing. This can be very easily understood by wavelet analysis. Uh, wavelet analysis also there are two types discrete wavelet transform and the continuous wavelet transform. 
and then short time Fourier transform because you know we can uh, and then there are the multi resolution Fourier transform also. But we will uh, not stress on this in the this course being the very first course in machinery fault diagnostics and signal processing. Uh, but this techniques are available nowadays in uh, the literature and people have been practicing them for using them in uh, condition uh, monitoring. And we will later on see some applications when we talk about applications, how some of these techniques are used particularly for fault diagnostics in bearings and gears and rotating uh, machines where uh, shafts have cracks, etcetera, how these techniques can be used to find out their faults. Okay. Thank you.